So this is chapter two of Biology 100, looking at the chemistry of life. In this chapter here, we're going to look at some of the basic chemistry that is essential to know for biology. Let's see, why are we sticking there? There we go. And so it'll just be a brief overview of chemistry, some of the macromolecules of life, starting from the elemental level all the way up to some of our basic building blocks that are going to be the chemicals that make up living structures. So your elements are the smallest units of individual chemical makeup. You cannot break them down and have them retain their identity. If you break them down into their subatomic particles, they will no longer have the identity that they do. They do exist and have subatomic particles. It's just not going to have the same properties to it. The most common elements in biology are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus. And you can see they are abbreviated here in the presentation notes with their chemical symbol. The chemical symbols you can find on a periodic table. Most periodic tables will have the symbols and then the name of the element spelled out below it. Our macromolecules are going to include the carbohydrates, nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. These are sometimes referred to as the macromolecules of life. These are the four big chemical groups that you will find in any living matter. Matter is going to be anything that occupies space and has mass. So here you can see some pictures of some food, things like fruit, cheese, bread. These are all going to be sources of several of the biological macromolecules. We need to take in sources of those. If we're going to make bodies get bigger or cells get bigger, we need to take in the building blocks. And we do that through food. It's usually easier to relate to foods that we eat as humans, which you can see in these pictures. So when you're eating cheese, you're not just eating fats. You are actually eating several of those types of macromolecules. So the atoms are the smallest component of the element. It's going to be the smallest piece of the element that will retain its properties. Atoms are going to be made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. The protons and the neutrons are found in the nucleus, or in the center, and the electrons are going to be around the outside. When you look at a periodic table, you will also see some numbers on there. What those numbers are commonly going to represent are your atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons that are in that atom. And the atomic mass is going to give you the mass of the atom, and it's the total of the protons and the neutrons. The electrons are much, much, much smaller, so they're not really considered to be a significant contributor to the mass. So we just measure mass as the protons and the neutrons, and it's sometimes referred to as the mass number. So here in this diagram you can see the electrons are around the outside. You have the nucleus in the center and that's where you're going to find your protons and neutrons. So keep in mind when you look at these, these are representations that are going to show where you're most likely to find these things in an atom. If you just want to keep in mind this is where your probability of where you're most likely to find them. It is not absolute 100% of the time that those are the locations of things. So with the periodic table, it's going to be your chart of elements. It will give you a lot of key information about the element. There are different types of periodic tables that will give different types of information. It's kind of hard to fit all of the possible information you could about an element onto a single sheet of paper. So there are some tables that are more specialized. Generally, they're all going to give you the mass number and the atomic number, as well as the name of the element. They are also in the same order on all the different periodic tables, so they have the same arrangement. The isotopes are going to be different forms of the same element. They're going to have the same number of protons, but they'll have a different number of neutrons. So because they have the same number of protons and electrons, they're going to behave the same. However, they will have the different number of neutrons, which allows some of them to be radioactive isotopes. So they are unstable, and they can lose their protons. So with some of these notes, occasionally I do find things that are off a little bit here. These proteins should be protons. 
or there's some atomic particles to form a more stable element. So this radioactive property and them being unstable is what allows them to be used for carbon dating. So it's a way of approximate, approximating the age of things that are really old. They can also be used in medical applications. So with radioactive tracers, you can put a molecule in the body that you want to be able to trace and see where those go and label it with a radioactive tracer so you can follow its pathway through and see what part of the body is actually consuming that nutrient and where it goes. This is an example of a periodic table here. So things are arranged in columns and rows based on characteristics of the elements. So you can see over here you've got group 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, through 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on. There is more than one system of naming these. But when you look at these groups going down, everything in this column is going to have similar properties. Same thing coming in from the other side. And then in the center here is where you've got your transition metals and these are going to have different properties than all of these things on the outside. So most periodic tables will be color coded and here you can see there's a color code to the different categories that you have. So this is an example of something where you might use carbon dating. So the age of the remains that contain carbon are less than about 50,000 years old. And this is just in a pygmy mammoth. So the age can be term determined using carbon dating. Carbon dating is used for things that are quite older. You can't use it to age a human being. We're not old enough for it to work. When we look at chemical bonds, we have to look at models of a chemical for these to make sense. What is the easiest model to understand is the Bohr model or the planetary model, which is what we looked at a couple slides back, up here in the center, and would be your, like your sun, and then you have the planets or the protons that go around the outside. So chemical bonds are the result of interaction between two or more atoms to form a molecule. When we look at them, there is this octet rule that the outermost shell of atoms with low atomic numbers can hold up to eight electrons. So your first shell that you're going to have for hydrogen and helium is only going to hold two electrons. The next shell after that will hold eight, and the shell after that will hold eight. So we say this octet rule applies to atoms with low atomic numbers because when you get to atomic numbers past the first couple rings, this model doesn't work real well anymore. So the outermost ring likes to have eight electrons in it, and it will donate or accept electrons or share electrons to reach this. We refer to it as its valence. So if it's really close to being full, it's going to be really aggressive about trying to acquire more electrons to fill up its outermost circle. If it is a long ways from being full, it only has one in there, it's going to want to get rid of that outermost electron so that it's got a full ring underneath and will be stable. So when we look on the periodic table here, these all have eight in their outermost ring, except for helium it has two. All of their outermost rings are full. They're sometimes called the noble gases or inert gases because they're happy. They're not going to be reactive. Here in this row, you've got things that are one away from having a ring on the outside full. So down here, the second one down is chlorine as an example. Chlorine is really useful to us because it's very aggressive about seeking out that electron. So what makes it have good disinfecting properties is it's so aggressive about seeking out that electron that it will actually kill other microorganisms to take the electron from them. Over here on the other end, these are going to have just one in their outermost shell. They're going to want to get rid of that. And so you don't actually find any of these occurring in nature that have that electron. They will have gotten rid of it. And if they do have it, they're going to get rid of it explosively at normal atmospheric conditions. 
So an ion is an atom that has a charge. And it would have a charge due to having an unequal number of protons or electrons. So it, if it started out and it said, you know what, I need to get rid of this extra electron on the outside so that I can have my ring underneath be full, it would get rid of the electron, but it would not get rid of a proton. So therefore, it would acquire a positive charge. If it were to gain an extra electron, then it would acquire a negative charge. So cations are things that have positive charges. Anions are going to have negative charges. So this is showing here with sodium. Again, sodium would be in that first column. This electron here is alone. It wants to get rid of it. So when it does, down here, it's short one electron. It did not get rid of a proton. It's going to have a plus one charge. The chlorine, it is short one electron in its outermost ring, so it's going to be happy to take this extra electron from the environment. Now it has an outermost ring that is full. It's acquired an extra electron, and so it will have a negative charge. So the behavior of those electrons is what allows them to form their chemical bonds. The ionic bond is the attraction of the positive and negative charges. So here, when this would have a positive charge and this has a negative charge, they're going to be attracted to each other and will form an ionic bond. So that would be sodium chloride, which is what's in table salt. Covalent bonds are going to involve sharing electrons. So sometimes you're not real close to having a full ring on the outside or a full valent shell. You're not real close to having it be empty either. So instead, these atoms a lot of times will choose to share electrons with a neighboring atom. When they share them equally, we call it a nonpolar covalent. When they do not share them equally, when there's a difference in electronegativity or somebody's affinity for holding on to one of the electrons, we call it a polar covalent bond. When you have a polar covalent bond, the electrons are not going to be equally distributed, and you will end up with these partial positive and negative charges because of the electrons hanging out in one place more than the other. When those partial positive and negative charges attract to each other, we refer to it as a hydrogen bond. So these are weak interactions, but they are a bond that explains a lot of properties of things like water nonetheless. Another type of weak interaction are the van der Waals interactions. These are caused by temporary partial charges when the electrons move around the nucleus. So the electrons are constantly going to be moving around the nucleus. They're in motion all the time. This is what allows lizards to walk on walls, is they have tiny, tiny little hairs on their hands and feet that will have these small van der Waals interactions. So you're not going to find really big lizards things like alligators or crocodiles walking on the wall, they are too big and too heavy for the van der Waals interactions to actually hold them up. So this gives an example here. In the center, you've got a nonpolar covalent bond. You've got carbon in the center. It's a covalent bond because they are sharing electrons. And you've got four hydrogens that are equally distributed around the outside. Nobody is a favorite. Nobody's got a stronger pull than the other. Over here on the right, we have a nonpolar covalent bond. You've got two oxygens that are sharing two sets of electrons. They're sharing it equal. Everybody's happy. Over here on the left, you've got a polar covalent bond. So here you've got the oxygen, and you've got two hydrogens over here. What's not shown in this picture is the oxygen also has some electrons around on the opposite side of the hydrogens. And so on this side, in this picture it's showing it as a partial positive charge. It's actually a partial negative charge that you're going to have on this side over here away from the hydrogens because it's going to have its electrons hang out over here and they're not going to get to go over here very often. So the accumulation of them hanging out on this side is going to give it a partial negative charge. Over here on the ends where you've got the hydrogens, these are going to have a partial positive charge. It's sharing electrons with the oxygen. You can think of it being kind of like kids in a car. If you've got a couple of toys in the back and you say you need to have this one shared between you, 
kids aren't going li to like to have one of those toys move to the other side. That means it stays in the middle zone of the car. So if the hydrogen were to say, okay, I want to take this car over to my side, oxygen would not be happy with it. It has to stay in the middle. So what you end up with is a partial positive charge over here on this side of the hydrogens because oxygen does not want to let the electrons get that far away. So when you have these partial positive and partial negative charges, this will form these hydrogen bonds. And this is what you will see in water. It explains a lot of the properties of water. So things that bond similarly will tend to dissolve together or mix together more easily. It's just a general rule of thumb. Here is a picture of oil and water. So oil is going to be a nonpolar compound, so it will not dissolve in water, where water is a polar compound. So things that have other polar compounds will be more likely to dissolve in water. Water is important because it makes up, in most living things, over 90% of your cells. It's going to be polar. It will form these polar covalent bonds and hydrogen bonds. And depending on something, if something is hydrophobic or hydrophilic, it will change its interaction. Something that is hydrophobic is afraid of water. It does not like to be around water. Something that is hydrophilic will mix well with water. So oil is an example of something that would be hydrophobic. Water tends to stabilize the temperature. Your temperature is a measure of motion or the kinetic energy of molecules. As you heat up water, what's going to happen is the molecules will start to move faster and faster. When you boil water, they actually start to move so fast that some of them will escape from the liquid water and turn into steam and go from being a liquid to a gas. Water is going to absorb a great deal of energy before the temperature rises. So it's going to take a lot of heat, a lot of energy being put into it before you're going to actually have the water heat up. It actually takes less energy to heat up a pan than it does the water in it. So if you go to boil water in a pan, you'll notice that the pan will feel hot before the water inside will. Evaporation is just the release of individual water molecules from a liquid. So when you have water boiling and those water molecules escape, they're going to take their energy with it. So it's going to cool what's left behind. When you sweat, it's actually evaporation that's going to help to cool your skin. When some of the moisture from your skin evaporates and leaves, it will take some of the energy with it, which is going to leave less energy and a cooler temperature behind on your skin. Water will form a lattice-like structure. This is what allows ice to float on top of water. So when water starts to make ice, it's going to become less dense. When it gets down, it's going to condense down as it gets cooler, down to about 4 degrees Celsius. Once it gets to 4 degrees Celsius, you're going to start to make the lattice, and that's going to start to push the molecules apart a little bit further, making it less dense. And so that's why you'll have ice will actually float on the water rather than sinking. So water acts as a solvent for many things. The solvent is going to be the liquid that allows a substance to dissociate or come apart. The solute is the substance that it's going to dissociate or come apart. And the solution is going to be the solute dissolved or dissociated in the solvent. When something comes apart in water, you're going to form hydration shells or a sphere of hydration around the substance that's come apart. So here you can see you've got sodium and chloride that has come apart, your table salt being put in water. So when the sodium comes in, you're going to have these partial negative charges that are going to all gravitate towards the, par the positive charge of the sodium and form this hydration sphere around it. Same thing here with the chlorine atom. It's going to have a negative charge, so you're going to have these partial positive charges that are going to surround that. And that's what will form the hydration sphere. When the solution becomes saturated, you can't dissolve any more salt in it because all of the water molecules are already occupied doing this. So if there's no more water molecules to form hydration cells, you'll just have that extra salt precipitate out into the bottom. 
water is cohesive. The water molecules will tend to attract to each other and keep together at a liquid or even at the liquid gas interface. So if you look at water when you spill it, it's not going to be shattered and flying all over the place. It's going to form clumps. So it's going to hold it together. It's going to have surface te tension, which is the capacity to withstand rupture when it's placed under tension or stress. So this is basically cohesion as well, except it's on the surface of the water. So when you look at insects that can walk on the water, the force of the cohesion holding the water molecules together is stronger than the force of gravity for the insect. You and I are not going to be able to walk on water. The force of gravity pulling us down is going to cause us to go through the surface of the water. Adhesion is the attraction of the water molecules and other molecules. This is what allows water to climb up a straw or have capillary action in plants. When you put water down at the bottom of some flowers, if you've got flowers in a vase, the water will travel up through the stems to the flowers themselves through capillary action. This is showing a needle floating on the surface of the water. So this single needle isn't heavy enough to actually have the force of gravity penetrate the force holding the water molecules together. So it ends up being suspended on the surface. So when water molecules come apart, they don't always come apart equally. And this will cause a pH, which is your percent hydrogen or per potential hydrogen. And it's on a logarithmic scale that runs from 0 to 14. So basically what you're looking at is how much hydrogen is available or how much hydrogen has been absorbed in the solution. One way of measuring this is with litmus paper. It's been treated with a water-soluble dye that will act as a pH indicator. So there's usually a key that will go with it. You dip the litmus paper into the solution that you're looking at for about 30 seconds and then look at it and compare the colors. There's also pH meters that will be able to measure this as well. Something that is neutral is going to have a pH of 7, which is going to be pure water. Things that are acids are going to provide free hydrogen ions. Things that are bases, sometimes they're defined as soaking up the hydrogen ions, other times they're defined as providing hydroxides or the OH ions. Buffers are going to be chemicals that help to absorb a pH change. These are particularly useful in living systems because a lot of things are turned on and off by a change in the pH and you don't want them to be turned on and off too easily. So if you have a buffer in there, it's a way of preventing things from getting turned on and off too easily in a cell. So these are some examples of some things along the pH scale. Pure water here is at pH 7. Your urine is usually between a pH 5 and 6. Black coffee, your gastric acid is way down here. Lemon juice is about a pH 2, orange juice. Down at the other end you've got soapy water, bleach, ammonia that are going to be bases. So down here the numbers 1 through 6 these are acids and then over here the 8 to 14 these are bases it actually goes out from 7 so if you have something that's a pH of 6.5 it is still slightly acidic so just because something is more acidic or more basic doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad having the appropriate pH in the right place in a living system is what's important so when we start to look at our biological molecules, we have carbon that is taking center stage here. Carbon has six electrons. Carbon is going to make up, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen are about 96% of most cells, so carbon is the vast majority of that. When we talk about carbon-based life on Earth, everything uses carbon as its central molecule. Carbon is going to form four covalent bonds. So the first two electrons go to that innermost shell to have two be full. Then you have four on the outermost shell. It's halfway full. So this is an example of carbon forming four bonds. 
they are covalent bonds with hydrogens to form methane. So each hydrogen brings an electron that it's going to share. So as you go around, there are two electrons in this carbon and hydrogen rate relationship, two electrons here, two electrons here, two electrons here. So the carbon is happy. It's got eight electrons that are in, present in its outermost circle. Where we're going to find a lot of carbon is in carbohydrates. These are used for energy for the cell. Your carbohydrates or sugars are going to be multiples of a carbon, two hydrogen, and an oxygen. So what this means here with the parentheses is you're going to have multiples of a ratio of one carbon, two hydrogen, one oxygen multiple times. So for a six carbon sugar, this little n would be six. It means it's got six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. If it's a five carbon sugar, it means you've got five carbons, 10 hydrogens, five oxygens. So it's just five of everything in the parentheses. Carbohydrates are also known as saccharides. So a monosaccharide means one sugar. Those are going to include glucose, galactose, and fructose. Disaccharides are going to have two sugars. These will include sucrose, which is going to be a glucose and a fructose together. Sucrose is commonly known as table sugar. Lactose, which is going to be a glucose and galactose, that's milk sugar. And then your maltose is glucose and glucose hooked together, that's your malt sugar. Your polysaccharides are going to be multiple sugars connected together. Some examples of starches would be amylose or amylopectin. So pectin would be something that you would see in fruit. It tends to be underneath the skins of the fruit. It's also something that we put in jellies and jams artificially to thicken them up. Glycogen is a stored carbohydrate present in animal cells. We store it in muscle and liver and humans. Cellulose is a polysaccharide that's found in plant cell walls. So cellulose is one of those things that we are not able to digest as humans. If you look at what would happen if you eat grass, the same thing's going to happen to you eating grass as if your dog eats grass. It's going to come out whole at the other end. The only change will be how much you chewed it. Chitin, this is present in arthropods and in some fungi. We are able to digest that. So this is some examples of how we have carbons present in the different macromolecules. Up on top, A is a molecule of stearic acid. It's a long chain of carbon atoms with hydrogens attached. It's a fat. B is an amino acid. It's glycine. It's going to have the carbon in the center. Over on the right, you have a nitrogen with two hydrogens. That's your amino group. Over on the left, you've got another carbon with a double bond to an oxygen and then an oxygen and a hydrogen. That would be your carboxyl group. So this would make up your amino acids. And down here is an example of glucose in its ring format as a sugar. So glucose, galactose, and fructose are all monosaccharides. So they're all going to have the same chemical formula because they're isomeric monosaccharides. They have the same chemical formula, the same number of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens. They're just arranged slightly different. So glucose can also be in a linear format, which is what you see in this picture. So the structures of polysaccharides are going to vary, but all polysaccharides are going to be made up of monosaccharides. And they're going to all have that chemical formula of the CH2O with the N outside the parentheses. So this is an example here, cellulose. With cellulose, you can see that it points down to this little bond with oxygen. Up here, you can see with starch over here with chitin. So your lipids, these are sometimes called fats. 
Lipids are nonpolar, they're hydrophobic, and they're going to be long hydrocarbon chains. So it will include fats, oils, waxes, phospholipids, and sterols. Fats are commonly what we call our triglycerides. That's the most common form of fat in your diet as well as in your body. It's going to have three fatty acids as well as a glycerol molecule that it will be attached to. An oil is something that's going to be liquid at room temperature. Part of what's going to make it liquid at room temperature is how saturated it is. So that's another thing we look at with lipids is are they saturated or unsaturated. One that is saturated is attached to the most number of hydrogens it can be. One that is unsaturated, instead of having it be attached to a hydrogen, it's actually going to form a double or a triple bond and share an electron with a neighboring carbon two or three times rather than sharing it with a hydrogen. Saturated fats are going to be more stable at room temperature, so they will be solid. Your unsaturated fats will be more liquid at room temperature. When we look at cis or trans fats, we're looking at the spatial arrangement of where the hydrogens are, as well as another molecule that's being present on there. If they are next to each other, we refer to it as cis. If they're a diagonal to each other, they're called trans. It does take different enzymes to act on those, so they can have different properties. Your phospholipids, these are found in the plasma membranes. These are going to be fatty acids attached to a glycerol. So you're going to have two fatty acids attached to a glycerol instead of three that you have in the triglyceride. And in place of the third, you're going to have a phosphate on it. So that will give it some unique properties for your cell membrane that we'll talk about later on this quarter. Your sterols are ring-shaped fat. Cholesterol is the most common one in animals. There are other sterols other than cholesterol that are found in plant cells. Your waxes are hydrocarbon chains that are going to have an alcohol group and a fatty acid. Some examples of these would be beeswax and lanolin. So fats play an important role in living systems. This is showing a river otter here and he's got hydrophobic lipids in his fur that are going to help protect him from the elements. So if you take a look at ducks, they're real easily to notice this. You can put a duck in the water and it comes out and it's dry because its feathers are going to have an oil coating on it that's going to keep them from getting wet. That's going to keep that cold water from getting down to their skin so they don't mind getting in cold lakes. Here is showing you a saturated fatty acid versus an unsaturated fat. So you'll notice with the saturated fat, it's nice and linear. You could stack those up nice and neatly. The unsaturated fat, where you've got this double bond here, you've got a little bend in the molecule. That means it's not going to stack up as neatly. It will be less stable because it doesn't stack as neatly, therefore liquid at room temperature. Your triglyceride, you've got three fatty acid chains here that are attached to this glycerol. Where with your phospholipid, you've got two fatty acid chains and this phosphate group over here. And then the sterol, you'll notice the ring-shaped fats. <coughs> This is showing an example of cis and trans. So here you've got one hydrogen in red to help illustrate the point. They are both on the same side of the molecule around the double bond. This is a trans fat when they are on opposite sides of the double bond. So proteins are going to be structural in cells. They tend to have roles being regulatory. They can be contractile for things like muscles and protective for things like your immune system. All proteins are made from 20 different amino acids. Some of the things they're used for to make enzymes, these are catalysts and biochemical reactions that will help to control the rates of reactions or whether or not reactions occur. Proteins can act as hormones which are signaling molecules to deliver messages in cells. Proteins also can denature. When something denatures, it's going to change in shape and it will lead to a loss of function. An easy to picture example is if you cook an egg. 
Heat and pH are two things that will denature proteins pretty easily. When you heat up an egg, when you first drop it in the pan, it's going to be slimy, kind of clear. As it starts to get warmer, it's going to start to turn white and become solid. That's when the egg has become denatured. Amino acids are just the monomers that make up the proteins or the peptides. A polypeptide is a polymer of an amino acid. And proteins are usually going to be made up of multiple polypeptides. Sometimes those terms are used interchangeably, but that is where the key difference is. Polypeptide is multiple amino acids hooked together in a polymer, and a protein is multiple polypeptides. With the peptide bond, this is how you're going to combine amino acids together. You're going to have the carboxyl group of one and the amino group of another combined, and they will pull a water off. This is the basic structure of an amino acid. You've got a carbon in the center, the carboxyl group on one side, the amino group on another side, hydrogen on one side, and here you have this R group or the variable group. So in all 20 amino acids, this part out here is the same. The only thing that is different is what you have in place of R. So for example, here is alanine, lysine, aspartic acid and valine. The only thing that is different is what's present in R. When we look at the protein structure, there's four levels to protein structure. These are used to form the shape of the protein, and the shape is what's going to determine the final function of the protein. Proteins tend to work as lock and key mechanisms with each other. So our primary structure of a protein is going to be the sequence of the amino acids. Your secondary protein structure is going to be forming these beta pleated sheets that appear as kind of a zigzag here, or forming these alpha helices. Your tertiary structure is going to be the additional three-dimensional folding on top of your primary and secondary structure. It's almost like an origami project. Here you've got the piece of paper. Here you're going to make your first fold. Here you're going to make your next fold on top of that. The quaternary protein structure is going to consist of more than one amino acid chain. So it would be if you had two pieces of paper and you made one of them the flower, your origami flower, the other one you made your origami stem and you put them together, that would be your quaternary structure of your final protein at the end. Next we have the nucleic acids. These are going to be what our DNA and RNA are made of. They're made up of nucleotide monomers. Nucleotides are just your nitrogenous bases that are going to attach to a pentose sugar, which is a 5-carbon sugar, and a phosphate. So your DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, it's in the shape of a double helix. The strands are going to be anti-parallel, so they're going to run in opposite directions kind of like this cars on a street travel in anti-parallel directions. Along the sides you're going to have the sugar phosphate backbone and the nucleotides are going to make up the rungs of the ladder. Now here you have a nucleotide and a nucleotide has three components to it. You've got your nitrogenous base here. Here you have your pentose sugar, so five carbons in this sugar. And then you have the phosphate group. This is the double helix model that was established by Watson and Crick in 1953. So here you're going to have your nitrogenous bases, two of them going across making up the rungs of the ladder, and out here on the side you've got sugar and phosphate, sugar and phosphate alternating to make up the backbone. And this is the end of chapter 2.